come out of the shadow of my father. I love him as a parent. I cherish his love for me. I am sorry that power corrupted us. How can you forgive somebody who does some horrible things like this? Unforgivable things. And yet, you have to, if you want to really move on. If you're asking me if I'm going to forgive that I had to escape my country with a daughter, that I've been harassed for so many years here in America, if, I, if I'm going to forgive uh, uh, having a very uncertain future, no, I won't. Lo que pasa es que yo ya me cansé de explicar algo que no quieren entender. Vi que todo lo que hacía, todo lo que contaba que era verdad y lo probaba, me lo cambiaban y no me querían oír. Mantendrá el Poder Judicial y la Asesoría de la Contraloría. Las cámaras quedarán en receso hasta nueva hora. Eso es todo. en Marruecos. <risa> Además que fue un excelente padre. Era un hombre muy estudioso y cuando nosotros éramos chicos jugaba con nosotros, eh, nos enseñaba geografía porque era profesor de geografía también. Por eso yo conozco mucho la parte geográfica. Para mí es muy importante. A lo mejor por eso también me gusta tanto viajar, no sé. Cuando mis sobrinos eran más chicos yo los traía aquí, a mis sobrinos. Después de mis hijos, mi sobrino. ¿Qué? ¿Cuál sería el motivo que no pueden grabar acá? ¿Quién dijo? La administración. ¿Desde cuándo? En el gobierno de mi padre no, no había esas provisiones. ¿Y cómo se llama usted? Lucía Pinochet. O sea, la Lucía Pinochet. Quiero hacer una grabación. ¿Cuál es el motivo, me dice? No, se están necesitando a ellos, ¿no? Usted no dice que no ha a nadie, Nancho. No. No, a ella misma, porque la anda grabando a ella. Oye, pues si no, si no, no importa, si hay otros ¿Sí? lugares. ¿Sí? No hay problema, ya vale, no hay problema. Ya. Ah, ¿Eso es todo fácil, no? Ya. Yeah. <risa> ¿Do people recognize you in the street? La gente contraria, nada. La gente favorable se acerca. Pero también me ha pasado que gente contraria en la, en la calle me insulta, asesina. Hija de un asesino. No, pues es parte de todo lo que estoy viviendo. ¿Qué pienso ahora? Que es muy difícil analizar hoy lo que pasó hace 40 años atrás, porque la realidad histórica cambió. Que ella no me pregunte muchas cosas sobre el gobierno de mi papá, porque yo, primero, no fui parte del gobierno. Yo era familiar, hija. No, y a mi papá yo lo defiendo porque la dimensión que yo tengo de él es de un padre bueno y, y que dedicó su vida por este país. Porque en el fondo también hay un asunto. Él fue un dictador y sacó adelante este país y lo entregó a la democracia bien. Eso, eh, digamos, sería como mal ejemplo para el mundo. 
porque ellos siempre dicen que los dictadores tienen que ser malos y tienen que ser asesinos, tienen que ser ladrones, tienen que ser eh, crueles. Entonces, que aparezca un hombre humano, eso no les conviene. Cubana sabe también pelear y ganar batallas en este campo. Fidel was sent to jail and my mother wrote to him, he wrote back. I, did, I think that the relationship started with uh, this uh, letter exchange, which I mean, I haven't seen anything more powerful than a letter. You know, a handwriting letter with the touch and the smell of a good old letter that is so powerful. So Fidel left for Mexico and, and My mother gave birth to me when he was in Mexico. Fidel Castro emerged as the leader of the resistance movement. <coughs> On January 1st, 1959, Batista the dictator was overthrown. Fidel Castro's arrival in Havana was triumphant. He was the hero, the liberator of the Cuban people. Castro went soon to the United States. He was greeted enthusiastically as a Cuban nationalist hero. But for a man who denied he was a communist, Castro, back in Havana, acted strangely. In my mother's mind, nothing bad was happening in the country, for the contrary. In my father's mind, they took away his clinic, They took away everything. He, they took away his wife, so everything bad was happening. He wanted to save her, his daughter from that. You just said, my father. That's what I always say. I mean, in my papers, my father is Orlando Fernandez. So, I have two fathers, but Orlando knew from the beginning even before my mother got pregnant, that she was in love with Fidel. My mother told me I was uh, Fidel Castro's daughter when I was 10, 10, 10 years and a half old, which wasn't nothing that at the end surprised me either because he was the only presence in the house. So until I was 10 years old, I thought my father was this uh, bad guy that abandoned the country, which I loved because I have the greatest memories also about Orlando Fernandez, right? He was tender to me when I was small. He was uh, nice, gentle, so, th and he left. They made you write down in school if you have people that abandoned the country. So it was kind of very humiliated to have relatives that had abandoned the country. They, they made it precisely humiliating for you. You, you were like uh, stigmatized, so, When suddenly Fidel Castro became my father, it was like, oh, that's a release. I always had the feeling that nothing was normal around me because people will approach you asking you for things. It doesn't matter what. I mean, it could be a house or a pair of shoes, which I didn't have, by the way. My mother gave everything up, and she somehow also became a leper because nobody will approach her. I mean, no man will go and ask her to go to a party or to have dinner with because they were afraid. They always said, well, it's, a, it's like a sacred cow. You know, she, she already belonged to a comandante, so I won't even, and she has a daughter with a comandante. What, what will I do her? Will I help her raise the comandante daughter? Everybody was scared to death. aufgerissen war, hat der Führer geschlossen und in dem Schmelzziegel der Idee hineingeworfen, was aufeinander strebte und gegeneinander stand. Parteien, die Klachen, die Schnell
Legende, die Konfession. Und da fragen mich immer die Leute, wann hast du zum ersten Mal gehört, dass dir klar wurde, wo du herkommst, bla bla bla. Das war zur gleichen Zeit, wo wir in ein neues Wohnung gezogen sind. Meine Oma kam dazu, die Großmutter, die von der Göring-Seite. Und da äh, gab es diese Dokumentation, die mittlerweile alle deutschen Kinder gesehen haben müssen. Die Dokumentation, als sie da in Auschwitz, die Russen oder Engländer oder Amerikaner haben da das befreit und haben da die ganzen Leichen gefunden. Fürchterlich. Ich kann mich noch gut erinnern und äh, es war fürchterlich und sie saß im Fernsehzimmer und mein Bruder und ich und sie hat gesagt, das ist alles Lüge und hat da also das total denied. Mein Bruder ist ein Jahr älter, anderthalb Jahre älter und der hat ihr einen Holzschuh an den Kopf geworfen als Antwort und äh, da habe ich ihn noch davon abgehalten, weil ich fand das auch nicht toll. Weil für mich, alte Frau, sowas macht man nicht. Also das, da geht es zu weit. Ist ihr erster Mann früh gestorben. Sie hatte drei junge Kinder. Sie musste also irgendwie durchkommen. Und da kam Hermann ins Spiel und hat äh, ihr unheimlich geholfen. Er hat äh, keine Probleme gehabt, da Massenmord zu begehen. Aber äh, für seine Familie hätte er alles getan. can ever be said about my father. My 1% is a drop in the ocean, but it's an effort that every Muslim son is obliged to do. In Africa, democracy is still a pipe dream in the sense that most Africans believe that absolute power is the only way to rule. He always had a saying, and this is my father speaking, he said, People took up arms to fight me. I fought back, but I did not kill innocents. Even though what happened to my father was worse than whatever happened to Milton Obote, because at least uh, the for, uh, his president, Milton Obote, managed to go to exile and he died peacefully in exile. My father was brutally murdered, so his life was cut short before he could live it out to his fullest expectations. I met Jafar, Idi Amin's son, at the uh, 50th anniversary for our founding father of the country, Apollo Milton Obote, at the Sheraton Hotel. The gentleman I'd gone with, Arthur Teungo, pointed him out and said, hey, that is Jafar Amin. I said, what, it is? Really? He's here? We were all kind of surprised because this is a, uh, something, a memorial for Paula Milton Abote and we all know that it was Idi Amin who overthrew Abote. So I said, yes, that's him. Hi. Ten years ago, uh, this probably I wouldn't have even wanted to meet him. I probably would have just said, forget it. No, 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 what? You know, the feelings were still raw and, you know, hard at that time. But we just unfortunately happened to be the children of these gentlemen that make part of Ugandan history. Godfrey is the son of uh, the late Obotho Fumbi. Obotho Fumbi was a uh, minister of defense and because Obotho Fumbi's family was very close to Idi Amin's family, they were constant in the state house environment. It only stopped in 1977 when after the death of the, of the, of the father. He's a perfect example of an innocent person. The man of God, also the, the Archbishop of Uganda, that is a that is I'm highlighting some of the, the the big issues of a death that happened during my father's time. Mm -hmm.
Siempre es muy interesante eh, leer la historia de Alina Fernández Revuelta, la hija, ¿cómo te decían? No, no, Rebelde me de eso, Fidel yo, Castro. Yo lloré con eso, yo ¿Sí? lloré con eso, sí, porque las editoriales te imponen los títulos de los libros, que son cosas que mucha gente desconoce, ¿no? Que las editoriales te obligan prácticamente, no, no... O sea, que ese no era el título que tú querías darle a tu libro. Claro que no, un adjetivo que ahora yo cargo como una losa. <risa> La forma en que entraste a este país y me llamó muchísimo la atención. ¿Cómo fue eso? Bueno, ¿Disfrazada de qué? De turista española. ¿Verdad? Y olé, claro. <risa> Porque me prestaron un pasaporte de una muchacha española que se sacó, se falsificó en otro lado. Bueno, es algo así bastante rocambolesco, ¿no? Pero tuve que salir con ese pasaporte que ya tenía mi foto. El nombre de ella, no voy a decir el apellido, era Victoria y estuve practicando la noche anterior cómo firmar como ella y algunas cositas así, ¿no? Entonces cuando salí de ese edificio ya transformada, mi hija había ido a buscar el taxi y yo me fui hablando como española hasta el aeropuerto José Martí. ¡Qué guapa eres! Bueno, ¿no sentías miedo? Soy un poco payasa también, sabe que lo de ser clown va, corre en la sangre. Y entonces, <risa> señora, buen entendedor con pocas palabras basta. Lo, lo disfruté de cierta manera, pero fue también el momento más desgarrador de mi vida, fíjate. Sí, claro. Óyeme, Alina, eh, cuéntame algo. Estuviste casada con uno de los bailarines principales del ballet nacional de Cuba, ¿no? Entre otros. Ah, sí, fueron no, muchos matrimonios. Entre otros matrimonios, no, otros bailarines, sí. <risa> Eh, ¿Cómo se siente uno cuando a uno le dicen tú eres la hija de Fidel? Por cierto, volviendo al ballet, <risa> es el papá de mi niña, el bailarín. Bueno, ¿cómo se siente uno? Eh, es un, eso fue un cambio de identidad para mí, porque mientras estaba en Cuba trataba de negarlo. Y desde que salí de Cuba, pues lo asumí. Pensé que asumiendo lo iba a ser un poquito más útil. ¿Qué te gustaría escuchar? Lo dejo a la elección tuya, fíjate no, que confío a la tuya, totalmente tú eres muy invitada. Estamos celebrando el Día de las Madres. Eh, lo que tú quieras escuchar. Pueblo mío, que estás en el Caribe. Tendido como un viejo que se muere La pena, el abandono son tu triste compañía Pueblo mío, me fui sin alegría ¿Qué será? ¿Qué será? ¿Qué será? ¿Qué será? Ya mañana se verá y será, será lo que será. Ya mis amigos se fueron casi todos. Come on in. Being Castro's daughter in Cuba is going to bring over you every possible reaction, depending on if they like him or not, uh, or they love him. Crazy love, or they hate him, crazy hate, or whatever. That's what you're gonna have. You're never gonna be yourself, and it took me many, many years to to try to, you know, to co at least convince myself that I was this human being who liked this or that or disliked this or that. I tried to to live a normal life beside that relationship. And I understood from the beginning that people were not reacting, I mean, basically, to me, uh, but to him.
little tea. Oh, no. My papa born here yes. and study in the school here. Begin the military school. Pero siempre siguió amando al paraíso. <laughs> que mi papá hizo el golpe militar con los otros militares yo pensé que si fracasaba lo iban a fusilar porque eso era el delito en lo que se hacía entonces desde ese momento que como que la vida de mi padre siempre la vi como que podía estar en un hilo y solamente Dios volviendo a nuestro Dios lo, lo iba a proteger gente que se fue de izquierda que arrancó del gobierno de, después del pronunciamiento militar lo inventaron muchas cosas. Inventaron que el Mapocho, el río, estaba lleno de, de sangre por la gente que habían matado. Inventaron muchas cosas en ese momento. Que eran imposibles porque hace una semana que había tomado el gobierno y ya hablaban de, de tortura y de mil cosas. Uh -huh. En ese momento yo las oía pero sabía que eran mentiras. O sea, yo viajé con mi hermana también para que mi papá estuviera tranquilo aquí, o sea, aquí en Chile. Como, ¿sabes tú lo que es hacer la pata? Adular. Eh, sí. encontrarle que todo lo que uno hace está bien y todo eso. Ya cuando volví a Europa me llamó la atención eso. Pero la gente What que no era mi amiga, porque ella nunca me ha adulado. Así que, no. O sea, la gente... Sí, aquí te quieren saludar. Yo soy persona inglesa. Yo soy inglesa. Mira inglesa, mira inglesa. Si la veo a ella, le digo, le explico a ella que viene en Inglaterra. Y para mí es un honor. Ojalá hubiese se conocido a tu papá, te lo digo pero de todo corazón. Muchas ¿Ya? gracias. En serio, amable, en serio. Gracias. Sorry, igual pero, yo en esta familia verdad. completa. ¿Ya? Y por eso también porque una cosa... No, thank you so thank much. Much. Thank you. Thank you. ¿Sabes lo que pasa? Hay mucha gente que todavía quiere mucho a mi papá. Se me ven a mí en la forma como esta señora. Es decir, que al poder siempre lo, lo rodea un montón de gente aduladora. Y, y con el tiempo yo he visto que es la gente más falsa. Porque esa persona que me da por ejemplo, o cualquiera, dejan el poder y ellos se han vuelto y se van con el otro que tiene el poder. No nunca fui amiga. amiga de esa gente, nunca, nunca. Aunque me dijeran que yo era la más linda, la más inteligente, lo más, nunca. Y no, Juan Pablo II, uh -huh. yo estuve conversando con él porque hablaba español perfecto. Y lo que más me impresionó cuando él le dije a su santidad, ruega por nosotros. Entonces me dijo, no, rueguen por mí, dijo él. Porque estoy muy solo, y a mí me, se me quedó grabado eso. Y ahí pensé, claro, el poder, el poder que sea, está solo. Yo tenía inquietudes políticas, como que participé en el Partido Demócrata Cristiano. Entonces pensé, que tenía que hacer algo para aportar al país. Y, y la fuerza para aceptar todo lo que nos ha venido ha sido porque, como te decía, creemos mucho, somos muy creyentes en Dios. The first time was actually going to exile. The whole issue of flight just meant, why are we leaving? So you suddenly realize the love you have for a parent is different from the people attacking and throwing us out of the country. So the whole point of moving to Libya and Saudi Arabia was traumatizing to us. That's where the relationship between a 12 to a 13 year old who, who I was, very inquisitive, started questioning and asking questions based on what I was reading and the responses he gave me. So we had a personal chit chat which was basically a wrangle between two people who loved each other but he felt I'm, I'm lucky in a sense that he felt he, he wanted to be able to explain things October 1st, we were fearful of coming to Uganda. There was a strong sense of apprehension because even in our passports we had negated the, the name Amin. So it was, a, it was important for us to really get in touch with our people and stay with our people. I even got a chance to marry into my own tribe. So 
I was seeking uh, safety and security amongst my own. In Islam, uh, uh, a Muslim does not uh, uh, inherit the, the, the crimes or the, the whatever has been perpetrated by the parents. So that sense of innocence was what stabilized us when we were in, in Uganda. Als ich Deutschland verlassen habe, da war ich ähm, 19 das erste Mal. Ich bin mit einer Freundin nach Mittelamerika, Mexiko gefahren. Da habe ich zum ersten Mal Ex-Nazis kennengelernt, weil die ganzen Leute, die äh, diese äh, Familie aus Honduras wollte mir was Gutes tun und hat mich den ganzen Deutschen da vorgestellt, die da lebten. Und diese ganzen Deutschen waren zufälligerweise nach dem Krieg nach äh, Honduras gekommen. Das hieß natürlich, dass sie Ex-Nazis waren. Und dann war ich jetzt in dem Dilemma, die waren eigentlich sehr nett. <lacht> und, aber trotzdem waren sie Nazis. Ne? Und dann bin ich weitergefahren nach äh, Nicaragua. Da war gerade äh, schlimme Sache äh, nach 40 Jahren zum Mossad-Regime. Alles in Aufruhr, äh, an jeder Straßenecke. Maschinengewehre und das hat mich auch sehr in Aufruhr versetzt. Auch habe ich auf der Reise ganz viele Ex-Leute aus Chile getroffen, die seit dem Putsch geflohen sind. Also es war so nah, dieser Faschismus auf einmal. Ne? Also, und da bin ich etwas ausgerastet danach. Das war meine erste Episode und das konnte ich irgendwie nicht verkraften. Ich glaube, ich hatte eine manische Episode, weil ich konnte nicht mehr schlafen. So hat sich das ausgewirkt. Ich konnte überhaupt nicht mehr schlafen. Und damals haben die alles schizophren genannt. Ich glaube, die wussten überhaupt nicht, wo. Jedenfalls äh, äh, habe ich da am Ende Elektroschocks bekommen. Und das war sehr schwer davon, mich wieder zu ähm, erholen. Das hat äh, unter anderem den Effekt, dass man seine... Äh, äh, seine Erinnerung verliert. Das hat also Jahre gedauert, bis die ganzen Erinnerungen wieder zurückkamen, wie ich überhaupt dahin kam. Dann bin ich nach Deutschland zurück. Also die, die haben mich nur rausgelassen, indem sie mich direkt ins Flugzeug gesetzt haben und zurückgeschickt. Das hat mir schon sehr geholfen. Ich hatte dann noch mal zwei kleinere Episoden und das letzte Mal war in Deutschland. Dann war meine Mutter war da, mein, meine käthe -Mom kam zu Besuch, mein Onkel Siggi kam zu Besuch mit Nüssen vom alten Baum aus der Landstraße. Also da, da hatte ich die Unterstützung, während ich... Ähm, oh, the speak. Weil äh, der ist da gerade gestorben. It was like being a child again, huh? Ich konnte da wieder Kind sein. Ne? the favorable because that anyway he went you don't say oh okay who's coming with me <laughs> with my brothers and sisters oh well no yeah. not really we want to stay with mom and this it's always me well, let's go if we go hunting i was on i, I told you remember i'm a, I'm a i was it was i can shoot i was and he was so proud of that you said the son of mine this guy he's jet, jet fighter and remember jet fighter that nickname was your dad who came up with it when yo that, yeah. remind me of that <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, when they came over to see us, they, everyone had gone shopping. Uh -huh. so I was the only one in the house, and uh -huh. I was upstairs. And I remember my dad calling me and saying, hey, Godfrey, come down, your hero's there. That's the first time I ever met your dad. So okay. This is, this is what, 73? No, 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 60. Whoa. Before, he was still army commander. Okay. So, came down to, I remember distinctly, that, he was that, in a plane 
mottled green army uniform. Yeah, this is my youngest son, and uh, he wants to be a pilot, and he likes soldiers. You're his hero. But the dad looked and said, "Oh, wow, he wants to be a pilot. Okay, we'll send him to Russia to be a, a fighter pilot." <laughs> then he said, "Okay, now you're you're jet fighter." This my dad's thing, expression my dad was is, this, sir. Huh? Yeah. Huh. When when he's brushing off something, it's always. If it's an accusation, he ni propaganda yao. Para, not propaganda. <laughs> para. Yeah, para. Yeah, well, the accent thing. <laughs> <laughs> what hogs? Oh my God! Are they there? That, that's the water bug. Like water bug. That's the water bug. Oh, that's the water bug. Let's see. What did your father say about my dad? If you talked about it. Any time afterwards in those days, if you ever asked him, I'd really want to know that. What what wow. was his reminiscence or what happened or so? What did he say? Let me put it into perspective. Yeah. Your father was a fulcrum. He was the administrative arm of what made dad function. He was the functioning nut in an engine. Yeah, all the weapons he was so. the man that made dad look normal. I'm not saying my father was abnormal. I'm just saying mm. he made, if you have a secretary or you have a spokesperson, mm. the person in America who they would call the one who makes me look good. Yeah. He was basically what they proverbially call the power behind the throne. There are a lot of those who come and uh, talk their nonsense you know about being the power. Listen, listen, I, listen to this point. Huh? Huh? Listen, you. listen to this point. I've heard. That. Listen to this I've point. Seen so listen many. to this point. No, listen to this no, point. No, huh? but I just want to just back you up. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen so many other people who are still alive now they're who claim there. to have been the power well, behind, behind the throne, that. but they're not. No. I know it. No, I mean, we know the truth. Let's go get back to this one. Okay. Your father was the technocrat the real person behind everything, but there were others who were in, uh, the equivalent of what I call Iagos, mm. who were always on the side. Yeah. It's like, why him? Mm. For them, they were thinking on an ethnic level. I this know. guy is from the East. Yeah, uh? yeah. We are your uncles. Mm. Why are you giving all the responsibility to him? Your father was the point man, the man responsible for everything. You get him, you get Amin. Huh? The best thing I can do in a car is take out your battery yeah. and see what you'll do. So when the incident came of the issue of the accusation of insurrection, it was so easy to accuse your father or implicate him in Orema's ambition. Leave alone the Archbishop. The Archbishop was a bridge. If you want to get to the community, go through the religious leaders. You come and put these people in the hands of the instigator. Ooh. Now, take them away until the tribunal starts. Ooh. Your father is being put in the hands of the person who feels you do, you're not deserving of your position. Now, the several people who were at that instant eh, were saying, no, we're not going to go through a tribunal. This, this, this is not a tribunal issue. Didn't he ask the whole crowd, the mob, what do I do with these people? The scream was what? Kill them, kill them now. Wow! Yeah, wow! Yeah, yeah. In Swahili. Kill them. Kill them. Now, that for me explains what is considered anarchy. Anarchy is you're in absolute power but you have lieutenants who feel they have the right to do whatever they want. With your blessing? No, 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 no. Not so much of a blessing. Mm. Anarchy is when everybody feels they can do whatever they want. I never take away the responsibility, the political responsibility of the deaths of Luwum or Riema and your dad mm. from my father. I don't take it away at a political level. Mm. If you're in absolute power, yeah, deaths course. under your watch becomes your, your responsibility. responsibility. With your dad, mm -hmm. it was the issue of having jumped the gun. You know, actions on, on the spur of the moment, which was a very bad negative side of dad. Spur of the moment decisions without evaluating. That is where the pain would come into him. It's like, if I had 
sat back and counted to six and made a decision. Mm. If I were, you see, it becomes a lamentation. Yeah, it's um, yeah, there could be a basis to truth in it. The president was misguided, and instead of him sitting down and saying, "Wait a minute, let's evaluate and let's investigate, carry on a thorough investigation," he reacted tragically. Gibt es eine hawaiianisch, ein ich weiß nicht, ist nicht eine Therapie, würde ich sagen. Die heißt Ho'oponopono. Übersetzt sind es nur vier Reihen. Das heißt, es tut mir leid. I am sorry. Please forgive me. Bitte vergib mir. I love you. Ich liebe dich. Und thank you. Dankeschön. Es hört sich an wie gar nichts. Aber. Also es ist ein langer Prozess, den ich da durchgemacht habe. Der ist insgesamt jetzt also wirklich bewusst mindestens elf Jahre lang, zwölf Jahre, seitdem ich mich damit so befasse. Das der Ausspruch von Hermann ist, wer Jude ist, bestimme ich. Das ist bekannt. Das ist in, hat sich zugetragen in einem seiner Werke in Berlin. Und ich weiß jetzt nicht, um, um wen es da ging. Es ging um einen, einen jüdischen Arzt oder Zahnarzt, der also sein persönlicher Zahnarzt war. Die meisten Zahnärzte waren jüdisch. Jedenfalls waren, war es also klar, dass dieser, äh, derjenige, um den es ging, eben, eben Jude war. Und äh, die Gerüchte innerhalb dieses, dieses, dieser Fabrik, dieses Werkes waren, wurden immer, immer lauter. Und an einem Tag hat äh, Hermann alle in die Kantine bestellt und marschierte da rein und äh, fing an zu schreien und sagt, ich weiß, was hier für Gerüchte umgehen und es ist mir egal, was ihr sagt, wer Jude ist, bestimme ich und verließ den Raum. Und da war das große Schweigen. Er hat zwar die Wannsee-Konferenz unterschrieben, aber man kann fast annehmen, zu der Zeit war er schon so stark unter, unter Morphium-Einfluss und hat überhaupt nicht mehr aktiv am, am Geschehen teilgenommen. Er war ja schon ein bisschen zur Seite gedrängt worden, dass er das einfach unterschrieben hat und dachte, mir ist das völlig egal. Er hat ja auch nur den Auftrag an, an, an Heidrich gegeben. Ne? Heidrich, du kümmerst dich um die Endlösung. Hiermit unterschreibe ich das. Er ist ja auch nicht erschienen in der Wannsee-Konferenz, sondern das ist nur eben, dass sein Name auf diesem Dokument war. Der Man kann natürlich auch sagen, das ist fast genauso oder schlimmer ist, äh, sich so nicht damit zu befassen, dass es einem egal ist, was da passiert, just take care of it, ja, so zu, ungefähr. Zu dem Zeitpunkt war ihm so ziemlich schon alles egal. Er hat ja auch nicht mehr sehr aktiv teilgenommen. Er Stimmt, wollte nur ja. noch Schätze sammeln. Ne? Er ist, hat den Krieg nur noch benutzt. Er war Gollum, ne? Er ist Gollum geworden. In die, in die, <lacht> ja, in, um in die besetzten Gebiete zu gehen und einzukaufen. Ne? Er Gollum. hat zum Beispiel der, Gro der Großmutter aus Holland also einige Waggons, Eisenbahnwaggons äh, geschickt. Ihre Großmutter mit Müll. Und mein Bruder und ich, wir waren so. Wir wollten nichts davon. Und mein Vater hat die Gott sei Dank, wir hatten die erst gar nicht gesehen, bis sie zu uns zog. Und dann mein Vater hatte einige Schulden, bevor er gestorben ist, und hat all diese tollen Sachen verkauft. Das waren richtige Schätze zum Teil. Und äh, wir waren da so froh. Das war wie so Karma. Dann. Und als er in Holland fertig war, ist er nach Paris gegangen und hat da einen gekauft. Im Louvre. Im Louvre. Ist dann also so, so durchgegangen, ne? so die Hand so halb hoch. Und oh, das nehme ich. Das nur noch, nur noch gezeigt. Ne? Und hinter die Adjutanten haben nur noch eingepackt. Das ist also. Das kann man sich überhaupt nicht vorstellen. Man ne? kann sich vorstellen. Power, aber Wahnsinn. Yeah. Ja. What is missing from Havana, what you can't find here? Oh, of course. First of all, 500 years of history, at least. <laughs> no, esta no se sabe que virgen es, pero está muy linda. Pero con esa capa amarilla, a lo mejor, a lo mejor es una, una virgen española, o sabe Dios qué, ¿verdad? Le dijeron que era la de la Merced. One of the pictures belonged to my mother also. It's very sad, but that's what happened. 
It had happened to me many times that I had to recognize my mother's painting in somebody else's wall, which is kind of sad, but it's what has been happening for the last half a century in Cuba. People are getting rid of good, good things because they need the money. For my mother, the important thing were the revolution and Fidel Castro. Why were you in that picture? I would like to know. <laughs> my mother is a very strong woman. I never saw her crying or complaining about anything. But you can't say when somebody's unhappy. You, you can't say, you know. I would have killed for her. Then when I grew up, I realized that it wasn't the same feeling from her to me, see? Since I became an adolescent, I wasn't happy in that country. I ne never ever adapted socially to the whole process, meaning that it, it, it made the relationship between my mother and me more difficult because it was quotidianity. The country I loved, the government she trusted, that's, that's what I wanted to leave. That's what I hated the most. That's the place I felt a prisoner in. My experience with Fidel Castro is more the one of a Cuban child that was growing up, you know, dressing in uniform, marching all the time, chanting anthems and revolutionary slogans, and, you know, see madness around me, hysteria and madness. That's what I remember. I don't remember feeling any hate personal hate for him. I felt betrayed, of course, by the revolutionary process in my country. I didn't consider or even consider that the promises were kept. They lied to us systematically. But my mother was also lied. My mother is not, is not the, the author here. It's just a believer. The first thing that Fidel Castro said publicly is that we were not even close to become a communist country. I know you are worried. First of all, if we are communists, and of course, I have said very clear that we are not communists. Very clear. And he affirmed that many, many times, until one day he changed his mind. One day, not in a public place with you know, where he usually gave all his speeches, but in a theater, very secluded, with people already preparing the crowd. What are we? Camera, and camera stand and said, we are communists, and well, from one day to another, we were transformed. ¿Cuál es, compañero? ¿Cuál es un compañero de aquí? Los compañeros de acá. Los compañeros de allá. Los compañeros de allá, Partido Comunista de Cuba. So, get to power and control power in, a, in, a, in every way it takes time and takes a lot of lies, of course. <laughs> You're not going to go there and say, hey, people, I'm going to despise you, use you. I'm not going to feed you. I'm not going to allow you to have new shoes. And people are going to hail you and applaud you. That's, that doesn't happen. <laughs> Era secretaria del señor Castillo. El señor Castillo era el que estaba a cargo de los derechos humanos en Chile. Él me invitó a tomar té porque me dijo que me tenía que decir algo. Me dijo, mire, hay un, una, una villa donde torturan a la gente y tienen detenida a personas. Y él dije, ah, no le puedo creer, sí. Y, y la gente, los vecinos oyen los gritos de los alrededores. Entonces le dije, ¿dónde voy a ir a ver? Y fui, mi marido me acompañó y fui. Y llegué y en realidad de partida dije, lo de los gritos es mentira, ¿ves? Era mentira porque no había ningún vecino. Estaba sola, sola, sola. Bueno, pero igual golpeé y me preguntaron 
¿Quién era? Dije, ¿quién era? Entregué mi carnet y me dejaron esperando, esperando, horas, dos, tres horas, cuatro horas y me fui, ya, enojada. Después, al día siguiente, yo me levanté temprano para ir a decirle a mi papá de esto que había pasado. Y antes que, que yo llegara, llegó el de la DINA, Manuel Contreras, y le dijo a mi papá que yo me iba a meter a un cuartel y que había hecho escándalo y entonces mi papá se enojó conmigo y no me creyó. Y las mujeres antes no podían entrar a los cuarteles. Y también le pregunté a Manuel Contreras sobre eso, detenidos y torturados, y él me dijo que no, que no era así, que solamente era un cuartel militar. ¿Do you think that the head of the Secret Service lied to your father or that they both lied to you? Es una duda que voy a tener toda la vida, no sé. <risa> Tratan de coartar tu propia independencia, la gente que está con él. Yo estaba en la universidad primer tiempo. Eh, para mí fue, tuve que repetir el último año porque yo era la hija del presidente y tenía que dar el ejemplo. ¿Te fijas? O sea, me costaba más esfuerzo todo. No, lo que pasa es que mi personalidad, yo soy muy frontal y muy sincera. Entonces, la gente que rodea a mi papá no creo que me quería mucho. <risa> todo lo que yo oía malo, yo se lo transmitía a mi papá. Le, le informaba, porque un poco quería ser yo los ojos y oídos de, de todo lo que, que, na, que no le contaban a él. Yo he conversado con personas de, que estuvieron en el Estadio Nacional y o yo tengo mucha suerte, pero me toca pura gente que me dice si sí, estuve preso, pero no me torturaron, no me hicieron nada. Ahora sí deben de haber pasado abuso, de excesos de la gente, sí. Y cuando podía ayudarle, ayudaba, ayuda a muchos. Pero tiene que pensar siempre que uno como hija no tiene ningún poder fuera del poder del cariño. You were not the daughter of the leader of this country, but remained a civilian. Who would you have turned out? Habría sido una persona más de clase media feliz, con hijo, con marido, con casa, con auto. Ich kann mal erzählen, witzig, wie wir uns kennengelernt haben. Ich bin nach äh, zwei Sachen, also gleich erwähnt. Also, am ersten Abend, erstens, war ich also in, in, in einer, mehrmals in einer Nervenklinik. Dann störte ich das, habe ich gesagt, warum soll mich das stören? No problem, da habe ich auch das schon mal gearbeitet. Ich, ja. <lacht> ich habe ja da schon mal gearbeitet, also ich kenne mich damit aus. Und dann als nächstes sagt sie, ja und dann da ist noch was, also ich bin also eine Göring. Dann sage ich, eine Göring, also so... Wie Namen, ja, und dann eine richtige Göring. Hm. Also nicht mit H Göring, sondern richtig Göring. Naja, dachte, naja, das ist ja interessant. Ja, damals war es noch so, dass ich das viel äh, Leuten also in so Situationen äh, erzählt habe. Das war so eine Art Mea Culpa. Interessante Reaktion, als wir das erste Mal zu meiner Mutter fuhren nach Berlin. Uh. Und die war also interessant. Die erste Frage war, Kennst du die Edda? Also an sie, du kennst du die Edda? Und der Göring, ja, den haben wir ja eigentlich alle gemocht. Mhm. Da habe ich also auch geguckt. Ja. Der die, Göring war beliebt. Der war beliebt. Sie. Der ja, ja. war beliebt. Wir haben Witze über den gemacht, aber eigentlich war er beliebt. Ja, ja, ist true. Und, äh, das war interessant. Das stimmt auch. Der war der beliebteste von allen Nazis im Volk, weil er irgendwie der Prinz Charming war. Äh, Menschlich aus, ah ja, sah übermenschlich aus, fett natürlich, aber. <lacht> ja, eben, das war auch menschlich, ja. Du musst ihn mal vergleichen mit, mit Himmler, also die Hässlichkeit selbst. Goebbels. Adolf oh, Goebbels, den haben sie den Teufel genannt, weil er ja hinkte auch noch. Ja. Ja, ja. Und, und Adolf selbst war ja auch nicht unbedingt die Schönheit, die arische, das arische Vorbild. <lacht> Osho hat sich ja damit gebrüstet damals in Puna, ne, als er ja, erfuhr, ja, ja. hat er sich öffentlich gebrüstet, wie in seinem Overstatement, einem übertriebenen Maße. Also ich habe die Kinder von Göring, Goebbels und von Hitler hier. Ne. Als also Hitler hat er gleich noch einen mit reingeworfen. Ne. <lacht> ja, das, das spielt ja, ja keine Rolle. Auch noch. Und dann hatten wir eine Landkommune, die gerade anfing in 
paar Leute davon sind nach Pune und haben Sanyas genommen zu Osho oder damals Bhagwan. Es, aber die meisten, die zu ihm kamen zu der Zeit, waren Deutsche, Juden und Japaner. Tata, ja. Und da haben wir uns ja auch alle wiedergefunden. <lacht> Täter und Opfer, nicht? Täter das spielte Opfer. eine große Rolle in den Therapie. Ich habe ja unheimlich viele Therapiegruppen machen müssen. Und da spielt es immer eine große Rolle. Also wir, wir Deutschen und, mussten immer den, die Nazis und spielen. Und die meisten Therapeuten waren, waren Jewish. Und die Therapeuten waren Juden. Und wir mussten dann also marschieren, möglichst in den Gruppen, möglichst nackt vor der ganzen Gruppe, im Sturmschritt. Und, das, und dann wurden wir mit, mit, mit Kissen beworfen und, und verprügelt <lacht> für, für, für Nazi. Obersturmbandführer wurden wir genannt und so. Ähm, ja, ja, das, das waren die Encounter also die, die haben das natürlich aus ihrem rausgebracht. Ne? Und dann, dann irgendwann hast du, hattest du genug und dann hast du zurückgeworfen und dann geschlagen und, und dann ging die Prügelei los. Die Entscheidung, kein Kind zu haben, ist, ist ein wirklich großes Thema und ich kann es nur anschneiden. Das war schon mal ein Grund, ne? diese ganze Inzucht, das nicht weiter zu betreiben und dann noch mehr Kinder von dieser Linie da in, in, das war eine, in, den, in die Welt zu setzen. Das war ein Argument. Dann gab es natürlich das Argument, es gibt zu viele Leute auf der Welt. Na gut. Ähm, dann aber, als ich nach Puna kam, war, waren die alle, das war, äh, was alle machten. Vasektomy, äh, Tubestein, äh, mein Bruder hatte es gerade gemacht, als ich hier angekommen bin, oder kurz darauf, ich glaube, hatte schon. Als ich dann viele, viele Jahre später mit äh, Ruth diesen Prozess äh, gemacht habe, diese, diese, äh, diese Encounter Group, die wir da in Bloodlines gemacht haben. Und sie hat mich gefragt, warum hast du das gemacht? Und dann sagte sie, oh, vielleicht wolltest du auch nicht äh, diese Linie weiterführen. Und ich sagte, hm, ja, da stimmt schon, da ist was dran. Ne? So muss man, kannst du ja selber erzählen, er wollte nie Kinder haben. Auch schon, als ich wieder welche wollte. <lacht> <lacht> als Bettina dann schwanger wurde, da. Ah ja, das ist ja auch diese Sache, ist ja nach, nach der Sterilisation passiert. Das Wunder. Ja, ja. <lacht> das war toll, ne? Das fand ich toll. Denn ich hatte ja nie den Wunsch, Kinder zu haben. Auf einmal kam es, nachdem wir zusammenkamen. Nie davor. Auf einmal habe ich noch Kinder gesehen. Und dann wurde ich schwanger. War toll. Ja. Wollte ich dann auch haben, ja? Dann war ich schon an zehn Punkt gekommen, wo ich sagte, na okay, dann, dann machen wir es. Dann ist es aber nicht passiert. Da habe ich eine Miscarriage gehabt, eine, eine, ja. äh, wie heißt das auf Deutsch? Fehlgeburt. Fehlgeburt, ja. Furchtbare Geschichte, furchtbar. Wünsche ich niemandem. War super traumatisch auch, ja. Oh. Und du, dadurch, dass sie also ziemlich ähm, depressiv wurde danach, das war es also für unsere Beziehung schon ganz schön. Ja, man ist so high, ne? Schön heftig, von, von, ne? Der, von der Pregnancy jedenfalls. Ich war, mir ging es so gut. Ich fand es so toll. Als es dann wegging, ähm, ich habe ja dir erklärt, ist so devastating, man hat so eine große Hoffnung. Ja? Und ich glaube auch, da sind dann so äh, die, die Seelen, die sich da, äh, naja, wir sind natürlich, denken ein bisschen indisch, die sich da inkarnieren wollen und die sind schon um einen so rum ja? und auf einmal puff, vorbei der Traum. Ja, das war hart. <lacht> My mom calls the Kampala house to talk to um, Uncle Musomaka and say, oh, how's everything going on? He says, you know, um, your husband, my dad, has been arrested. 
we don't know what's going on. Things are really bad. You know, that's the expression in Uganda. Those days. Mm. Things are bad. Things are, that's what my dad always used to say. Things are bad. Things are bad. He said, ah. So I have never seen my mom just break down like that. She just sat down, just started shaking. And then Sergeant of BI didn't know what to do. And uh, John, the other bodyguards, they didn't know what to do. They said, now what, what do we do here? They started shaking. Then my mom immediately said, you know what? Let me take off. Let me drive back to Uganda. We tried to tell her, no, don't go, don't go. I said, no, let me go. My brother Mike was on the table. We were all sitting here having lunch. Mama just left a couple of hours earlier. And Mike always liked to listen to BBC, you know, because we were all worried with you know, something had gone on. And then I remember Mike saying, uh-uh. I said, what? Dad is dead. That's basically the day, how I remember the day went. Uh, it was, yeah, it was horrific. And... Um, I guess it's like you made a statement about it's maybe being childish, but wishing you could go back in time mm. and yeah, and change things. Mm. And then let me, I remember. Let me, let me give you my. Let me, let me give let you me, the day me, just of wait. that day. Yeah, just wait. I'm let giving you the day also. Yeah, but I remember saying to myself, even a week later, a month later, two months later, I was saying to myself, I was saying, you know, uh, it's not too late yet. Um. If I could only get back home, we dig up dad's body, they can still bring him back to life. They can still bring him back to that. And that was a month, six months thing. After a year when then I said to myself, no, it's, it's been one year now. It's too late now to bring him back to life. Can we really stay together? Can we go the extra mile together? But the spiritual journey to Tororo, mm is unraveling the confidence that I've always had all my life. My throat is dry. I don't know what it means. Here's uh, the helicopter landing. Huh? That's where you would meet Dad here. Exactly. And Dad would come and land here. And then there was a time, uh, the second time when he came in, mm. they both, two helicopters came mm, and yeah. they landed here. And one of them didn't start. Okay. I, I think, yes, yeah, I don't know what happened with yeah, yeah. really, it, but they kept on trying to start the it. Gyro. And, yeah, the gyro. Yeah, the rotors kept turning and turning and turning. It just wouldn't, wouldn't light up. Omulako <laughs> Never hear no who it our mwangi, ye gal in parliament. Evanova to Samo Mwangi Ganiga Hafwa. Abatu Bangi no nibali muhulomati. Soy madre de Alfredo Roja Castañeda, detenido y desaparecido el 4 de marzo de 1975. Soy hermana de Nicomedes Segundo Toro Grau, detenido y desaparecido de Enrique Cosiva, la hermana de Newton Morales Saavedra, y los gustos detenidos. Porque hay tristeza en sus miradas. Hay soldados también y 
nos un dolor Porque desprecia el amor Y me está pinochet Si siempre huele mal Y ese dinero que recibe Pronto se terminará No podrá comprar más almas Ni a sus verdugos pagar Imagine a su madre Bailando sin bien soledad Bailan con los muertos Los que ya no están Amores invisibles Dejan de danzar Bailan con sus padres Sus niños también Y con sus esposos En soledad En soledad Un día va Ahora, yo creo que muchos abusos de los derechos humanos no, no estaba en el conocimiento, es lo que yo creo. Porque él se dedicaba solamente a trabajar ahí en el escritorio y delegó. Did he ever tell sorry for those people who were... Yes, yes, yes. Sí, yeah. Cuando estaba enfermo y todo, él escribió una carta... What was in that letter? What, what was in that letter? Una carta pidiendo perdón. El es que el Pide perdón a la gente que le causó dolor. Y explica que lo que significó para él tomar el poder y todo. Bueno, él explica que el país estaba muy mal y que él eh, se sintió con la obligación moral de, de tomar el poder para sacar adelante el país que él realmente lo hizo, o sea, pensando en lo mejor para el país, sin egoísmo ni ambiciones, y que en realidad si sí, quedaron muchas personas en el camino que sufrieron o fueron víctimas de esto, él les pedía perdón y decía que, que realmente lo sentía mucho, pero él pensó que lo que hacía era lo mejor para el país. Y así fue. ¿Qué dictador entrega el poder? No lo consideraron. No. Por eso me da mucha pena, pues. que era muy tarde y ya va a hacerlo. Santé, santé. I met people that spent a lot of time trying to discover the secret of his personality. I don't think it's that complicated. It's just uh, intelligence and narcissism. He kept himself as a lonely figure, you know, this lonely man dressed in fatigues, kept his personal life totally secretive. But really, is a, I understand that he's a fascinating character. When I was very little, he used to visit the house very frequently. Those visits were of a big guy, tender guy, playing on the ground with me. That's it. That, that passed very fast. I mean, I realized very soon that he was never going to be a regular father. So I knew. 
you couldn't develop any normal relationship with him. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't have a phone number or any place to call him. I didn't know where he lived. So it was impossible. It was impossible. So I was sitting there and I was listening to a speech and that never changed. It, it never ever became personal between us. Never. Um, I could see that he had no patience for that. He was not made for that. It was a person that was expanding his ideology and his influence to the rest of the world. I don't think he had much time to, to help an infant to do a homework. So somehow I understood that. See, I wasn't expecting anything else from a person that has been seven hours on TV. Fidel Castro in Cuba was God. Omniscient, omnipotent and omnipresent. My problem is not with him as a father. I've met a lot of bad parents in my life. My problem is with him as the leader of a country that I found destructed, ruined, you know, so changed from what I was born in. That's my grudge. It's not, it's not against the person, it's against the leader. What will you do when your father dies? You don't know how you're going to react to anything, but basically I, I don't think that I'm, I'm going to be lighting any fires, you know. I do know that a lot of people are going to feel overjoyed. They're going to party, as they did when Chavez died. But I'm not going to be part of them. Because, again, I don't think it's going to solve anything. I don't know if they had plans to open up um, a stadium. I don't know. I've heard so many versions about it. Will it be Fidel Castro dying or your father dying? It's going to be Fidel Castro dying. Just like that? Just like that. Any person that leaves Cuba is a traitor. When it's been considered a traitor, it's been called a traitor, or another word they use, or always had used for that, is gusano, which means warm. It's more original than rats. <laughs> but uh, that's the way we were called. And everything had changed maybe a year, two years ago, because they definitely want the, the worms to be reconsidered as Cuban, that way we're going to go back visit with money and this and that. I'm not the first person that had a split with its family because of ideological issues. Some parents have betrayed their, their children, some children have betrayed their parents or their uncles or any relative because of ideological reasons. And I'm, I'm sure in Eastern Europe they're going to understand what I'm saying better than in here. Will you ever forgive your father? If you're asking me if I'm going to forgive that I had to escape my country with a daughter that I've been harassed for so many years here in America, if, I have, if I'm going to forgive uh, uh, having a very uncertain future, no, I won't. No? Why? But it doesn't make me a bitter person. It doesn't make me to think about it every night when I go to bed. It's just, you see? I'm not obsessed with that. Of course, it's unforgivable. Piece. It's a couple and on top of it is like Auschwitz or Dachau or something. Can you imagine, you look at that every day in your apartment, how awful. 
it's 86 and uh, 78 they are. Wow. Tja. I can only imagine. They have to start fresh now. It's one thing to be a victim and get your attention from that and then just to be yourself again. And a lot of them do, do that, of course, they, they get on with their lives and, and they just push it away. That's most, most people did, I think, and not talk about it. It's probably the fewest who do this. It's very painful to do this every day. So hard. Who are we to say, you know, how to, how to deal with this dilemma? It's horrendous and they probably lost their whole family and it's awful. I mean, all, all one can do is say, look, this is now, this is me, I wish you well, I'm sorry. Forgive my ancestors, please forgive them and thank you for listening. Cannot do more than that. I can't undo it, what happened? I mean, you can't do it all when you sell 20 more bars, when there's not enough space. Like in this case, you have to try to break No, 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 I know. And that social system, especially after living in America, It was very moving for me to go to Budapest, to go to the Holocaust Museum. And also to the beautiful so, so, I'm not so fanatic about things like that, but when I went there, I was... What the coincidence for me sitting here, right? Moved, like, really. We're doing what we started two years ago with Bettina and Adi. What's the theme? Uh, it's them. them. <laughs> it's them. You tell them. On you them. Tell them. I, uh, since we had the Jewish theme, I'm from a famous Nazi family. Oh. Part of my family was Nazi, part of my family was anti-Nazi. Interesting. Yeah, very. And uh, Göring is to me, you know, like yeah. Hitler, that's my grand-uncle. Yeah. Wow, this is a documentary in itself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've, there's been a lot like of... Like your yeah. grandfather probably gassed my grand-great-parents exactly, like, like that. Exactly like, like that. Wow. Yeah, I know. See, that's how it goes. We're, we're okay. We're, we're okay. We're fine. <laughs> so it's been a lot of reconciliation. Wow. So you have a special role on this planet. Looks like. Oh. Not, exactly. You got it. Not such a... You got it. Not an easy one. No. Uh, incarnation. Karmic yeah. incarnation. You got it. Which is uh, she's a healer. It's an interesting thing because in my world of having quite nice German friends, but I was I inherited the aversion and it took me years to go beyond that. I don't know how it, it came be because I have good German friends, but. You know, it was a it was such a barrier at one point in my life. I can imagine you're not the only one, and it seems to take the other side to heal. Like my biggest healing happened uh, when I did a documentary with this kid of Holocaust uh, survivors, and uh, it was like a real encounter group, and that really healed both of us. And wow. it, I'm not the only one. It happens all the time that it needs both sides yeah. of the descendants. Who get together and work it out? Hello, and say, okay, tea for you too. Newcomer, thank you. Yeah, well, we have to go beyond. We have to. When my mother arrived, finally, when she was allowed to cross the border, um, she, she 
got home and the body had already been brought back, delivered. But with his strict instructions that a casket shouldn't be opened, it should be buried immediately. So um, one of my uncles said, you know what, we can't do this because we don't know who's in that casket. His children aren't here, they're in Kenya. His wife, widow now, is in Kenya. So no one's here, how can we just go ahead? We can't do that, it's un-African. We can't do that. So then the soldiers decide, they listen to reason and they said, okay, we'll wait and see what else we can do. Let's just hold on for a day or two and wait. But you can go ahead and open the casket. Uh, what they saw was practically undescribable. We didn't witness it, we didn't see it. But my mother, well, she came later after they'd washed the body. But they said well, when they opened it, he wasn't in his suit that he usually used to wear. Uh, it was just a shirt, but it was caked in blood. The arms were crossed over his chest. And they were broken, and the face was showed um, trauma, a lot of beating and scratches. There were 33 bullet holes, three knife marks around the neck, broken bones. I'm not sure which one. I can't remember. The years have gone. My memory slipped me. And one of the bones was actually had actually torn through the flesh, so it was sticking out. And the leg, one of the legs also was broken up completely. The bone was also sticking out. That's the condition that I was told. The body started to decompose. Understandably so when you have open wounds like that. So they decided that, you know what, we better bury him. So my mom said, yeah, let's go ahead and bury him. Uh, we arrived one and a half months later is when we came. I'd broken my arm, I remember, on the motorcycle scrap, scrambling in Nairobi at the time. Uh, a month later, one and a half months later, is when we, we arrived. Uh, yeah, that was, that was bad. Mm. Why would uncle I mean, do this. Why? I mean, who came home, would run around, lift me up, joke around with that, call me jet fighter, and all of that. I just couldn't understand it when I was a kid. It took me a lot of years. I don't know at an uh, individual level mm. how much of a regret or sorry. I don't know how to say it. How do you say sorry? At yeah. the tragic end of this. Yeah. Jaffa, you know one thing? I sorry. can't even right, right, say right, right. sorry Never. on behalf of my father. I know. I know. But as an individual, a human being says sorry for what you have just said. I don't think anybody has had this. I have, I have never had the pain that I'm hearing. I see the burden of the cross you're carrying. And let me tell you one thing. Frankly, I feel sorry for you because you are really a genuine, decent and honest person and a true friend of mine. But what you're going through, I wouldn't want it in a thousand years. What happened, happened. We can't change the past. No way. We can only learn from it and move forward. You can't carry a grudge or say, oh yeah, this and that. No. Let God be the judgment, the judge of all that. You have Ugandans or you have in society people say like that saying, was it Gandhi? That an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. Well, 
here. Now, what's the point? If you're all blind, who's going to lead the other to the watering hole? On behalf of my family, the Al Amin family, and also on behalf of my clan, a lot happened. But there's one thing I know, and one thing I've always known, that this family has always been the family that were true friends to my father. When we were in exile, he used to lament. It is almost like when two friends go apart, or a marriage is, somebody goes through divorce. You remember the love. You remember the happiness. You remember the joy. You remember the sorrow. I was innocent as a child, but I will keep going and asking us to be one. May you accept my apology on behalf of my people, on behalf of my father, on behalf of the issues of power. The acceptance is a humbling experience for me. And I thank my mother. Thank you. The confession the son has made. You are a merciful father and you forgive. We pray and we understand you have forgiven him. These people loved each other. We saw them, they came here. That whoever asks forgiveness, you forgive. We thank you, Father, because you have forgiven us. Bring us together. Bring us in one. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. give this sheep as the atonement. This one is the symbol of uh, cleansing. May the two families come together and stay together and work together and help together and have the same love that they used to have in the past. On this day, this one will prove to us that we are one again, me and Godfrey, both of Fumbi. Hey, 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 hey,